Hi there, welcome back. Or if it's your first time, welcome to Free to Pursue on YouTube. I am Hélène Massicotte, and today I am pleased to bring you another book review. This time it's Happy Money by Elizabeth Dunn and Michael Norton. I was pleased to give this book five stars because it is truly remarkable. It is a key reference to learn how to do the best thing in the world with our money, and that is get the biggest bang for our buck. We often think of it from a um, getting a good deal perspective, but what Elizabeth Dunn and Michael Norton have done is given us a recipe on how to use our money to maximize our lifetime happiness. And I can't think of a better uh, way to think about money as being a vehicle to bolster our ability to be happy in this one and only life. So let's dig right in. I'll tell you what I, uh, from a high level perspective, what I think of the book and then get into the five main lessons that it contains. Let's get into it. So first off, who is this book for? It really is for people who want to maximize what they get out of their spending on an overall basis, not just for material goods, but just overall how they spend their money and what uh, spending categories have the greatest link to happiness. And the readability for this book is very high. It's, a, it's about 150 pages, backed by a lot of research, but it's not heavy-duty reading. It's, it's quite entertaining reading. It includes stories within its pages, so it's a, a relatively easy read. And what I liked about it was that the findings in the book are backed by solid research. And really the only thing I didn't like about this book, which is why it got five stars, is at 150 pages I thought, I want more. I want to know more about what their findings are and and more detail about uh, the uh, getting the biggest bang for my buck for leading a um, fulfilling and happy life. So I can I can certainly think about worse things to say in a book than to say that it's left me wanting more in a good way. Now something interesting as well about this book that is rather unique is that it has uh, co-authors. Now that's not unique, but what is unique is that Elizabeth Dunn is a researcher in uh, British Columbia and Michael Norton it at, is at uh, Harvard in the US. So it is a US and Canadian collaboration and there are two versions of the book. There is a Canadian version which has a blue cover and an American version with a red cover. This book really turns the idea of what makes us happy on its head. The American dream focuses a lot on acquisition, getting, getting that perfect lifestyle. Meanwhile, the findings that Elizabeth Dunn and Michael Norton share have little to nothing to do with what we would normally think as constituting the American dream. And they really have, in this book, identified five things that we can learn that should guide our spending. The first one is to buy experiences as opposed to stuff. The second one is to make a point of treating ourselves. Third is that we should focus on buying time. Fourth is that we should pay ahead of consumption. And the fifth one is that we get dividends from investing in others. So let's look at those five in turn. The first one was about buying experiences. So over 50% of a household's income, disposable income after taxes, goes to housing and transportation. Interestingly enough, housing and transportation are the least correlated spending categories when it comes to happiness. The more you spend on housing and transportation will not 
make you any happier. In fact, it could do the opposite because spending in those categories takes precious money away from what we could spend in those five points that I just outlined. To quote the book, we are happy with things until we find out there are better things available. Page 17. So if we're not going to spend on stuff, what do they suggest we spend on? The suggestion is that we spend on buying experiences. With experiences, we have all the anticipation up until we experience whatever it is that we are investing in. We can also share an experience with others and also have the memories of that experience after the fact. And as a matter of fact, having the memories after the experiences can be the most worthwhile part of planning and experiencing something in the first place. Something else of interest with experiences is that the easier the experience, the less memorable it is. So taking on large projects or tough experiences is a big source of satisfaction. However, marketers will give you the opposite suggestion is that we need to take a load off. We need to make things easier. We need to save time. We need to save energy. And that keeps us away from that satisfaction of doing hard things and to seek out things that may be beyond our comfort zone. So when it comes to things and experiences, one of the key factors for what we choose to get is that it is great if it uh, constitutes something that means we're treating ourselves. So for example, if we go to uh, our favorite coffee shop every day, and but we're, we're going every day, we're getting the same thing, it is part of the routine, it is no longer special. But if we go on occasion to get something and we look forward to it and we really enjoy it, we see it as something special, then that is what we would say is a treat for ourselves. It should not have lost that special meaning, that special feeling for us to get the most bang for our buck when we spend on uh, things or, again, experiences. It should feel that there should be that special feeling associated with the spending. And interestingly enough, just a $5 spend can be significant. The spending amount itself does not have to be high. The third category is buying time. Now, what does buying time mean? It is related to the fact that the more income someone makes, the more punitive it feels to take time off work. And so what a person tends to do is outsource their life, look for time-saving opportunities, and that has a ripple effect. It's almost like a vicious cycle because what it does is the more we outsource our lives, the more we look for quickness, quickness and efficiencies, the less patient we are, leading us to look for more things that are quick, more things that are efficient, and so on and so forth. And impatience and frustration can really eat away at our happiness. So the folks who are making a lower income can indeed be happier than the highest earners. And so it's important to think about how much time we have, how much time we make available to ourselves, and to use that time wisely to increase our happiness, as opposed to worrying about spending all of our time making money, buying things, or outsourcing activities that is not making us happier. There is a medium in this respect. Now, if we want to feel easily like we can get a raise somehow, wait for the next point. A big part of satisfaction in buying time is reducing or eliminating our commute. That's right, the more time we spend going from home to work and back, the less happy we are likely to be. Cutting out or significantly reducing our commute can feel like a 30% increase in income. It has the same boost in happiness and satisfaction. Now, whether it is to choose a different work that's closer to home or to have home become closer to work, either way, the boost of happiness occurs. 
The fourth lesson is the impact paying ahead can have. Paying ahead for experiences leads us to anticipate and think about the experience a lot more than paying for an experience on credit or paying for the experience for some, in some way, shape, or form after the fact. Having paid the money upfront well before the experience leads us to dissociate the cost from the experience and only focus on the experience. No distractions and no worries as we're on that vacation or that outing of thinking about the fact that we have this burden of having to pay for it once it's all said and done. The more we pay ahead of time for experiences, the more we can be in the moment. And again, experiencing things and not buying things leads to more happiness. So it has a compounding effect and it gets better. Because we've paid ahead, we don't have to deal with a four letter word that a lot of us are left with after experiences and that is debt. Not only do we not have to pay for it after the fact, we don't have to deal with the debt burden if we have saved up and paid up front. Point number five deals with investment. Now this is not an investment book, so we're not talking about stocks and bonds and, and savings rate. What we're talking here about investment is investing in others. Putting some of our money towards good causes and towards single or many individuals can be very, very satisfying. But the recipe for giving is not your typical recipe. The authors point to the fact that investing in others needs to follow the following recipe. We need to make sure that we are doing it of our own free will. Any sort of coercion in giving does not work. We have to feel that the gift has value to the other person. We have to feel we're making a connection with the other individual. And we have to feel like it's making a difference, it's making an impact in someone's life. And so a lot of the charity and the giving mechanisms that we have today are dissociated. We don't really get a chance to feel or to experience with the other individual what our gift is doing for them. And the sums don't have to be very big for it to make a difference. But if that connection isn't there, the two parties are not as well off in the exchange. I want to offer a bonus sixth point that is a lesson from this book. And it's near and dear to my heart, and that is saving money. And I don't mean saving money by spending less on a given object that we purchased. I'm talking about saving money as in having savings set aside. There's a big correlation in having a healthy savings rate and happiness. And that's because of the peace of mind that it offers. For a whole lot more about that potential for peace of mind in various aspects of our lives by having savings, uh, whether it's monetary, health, relationship, having a fair balance in those accounts can really help us. And a great book to cover that aspect of the peace of mind that having reserves of different things can bring is Scarcity, another fantastic book that I will be sure to offer a review on in the future. So there you have it. Elizabeth Dunn and Michael Norton show us that chasing that American dream isn't all that it's cracked up to be, but chasing experiences, making sure that we make a difference in this world, and really paying attention to taking care of how we spend our time and that we save a little bit for a rainy day is going to make the biggest impact on our uh, happiness when it comes to how we spend our various resources. If you want to see Elizabeth Dunn and Michael Norton explain some of the findings that are included in the book, then I would suggest you take a look at their TED Talks. Yes, they each did a TED Talk. And so I will link those talks 
in the notes that are accompanying this video. I think they are very much worth watching and I think you'll enjoy them. There are a number of other great books on the topic of happiness. I would suggest Essentialism by Greg McCallan. I'd also suggest More Than Money by Mark Albion and Enough by Patrick Rohn. When it comes to stuff and spending, I would suggest Simplify by Joshua Becker, Your Money or Your Life by Vicki Robin and Joe Dominguez, Spent by Avis Cardella, Enough by John C. Bogle, and Scarcity by Sandil Mulenathan and Elder Shafir. On spending on experiences, here are a few recommendations. The Last Lecture by Randy Posh and The Happiness of Pursuit by Chris Gillibo. I hope you enjoyed this book review of Happy Money. If you did, I would really appreciate it if you would uh, give this video a thumbs up. And if you like the content on Free to Pursue in general, you might want to consider subscribing. Thank you for your time today, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Take care.